Bonjour à tous. Hello, everyone. Please be seated. My name is uh, Boris Martin, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Alternative Humanitaire Journal, which has organized this debate along with other organizers. Welcome. We have people from different fields. climate change effects. But the emergency that I see would be to open and to secure legal means of migration in order to end this, these types of situation, in order to respect the, the fundamental rights of these migrants, the right to asylum, the right to the, these fundamental rights because these rights are not always uh, are not always applied. Right now, we need to have a system for legal migration because we see throughout the history 
of our society that migration helps develop societies. Today, they are perceived as invasions, as things to be contained. We are erecting barriers between people. We're building, we're building walls, as we have seen, for example, between Haiti and the Dominican Republic on an island that's not that big and that is being separated by a wall that is 360 kilometers long. We're doing things backwards. We shouldn't be building walls, creating more scars in a world that is already not doing so well. For this reason, I'm very interested in today's topic and in the works that you've done. We have some uh, researchers that are going to talk about security issues. It'll be about promoting humane security for global peace. And we will discuss migration at that event later, uh, later on which is why today's topic is very interesting for me. I'm very interested in your work. The group of which I'm part in the Senate have participated, has participated in creating a flyer a few years ago for a more hospitable France and uh, solidarity in Europe. This is Dumas coordinated the, this, this um, the drafting of this works. I think, I hope that France and the EU, unlike what's seen today, instead of building more walls, instead of pushing back migrants, instead of overlooking this crisis that is going on, will finally, uh, you know, pivot towards something different where humanity is key and our common fight. Again, I'm very happy to have participated in organizing this, uh, this debate here. I think it's a really relevant space to have this conversation. It could have happened in other places and in other institutions of the Republic but the Senate is relevant. I think that there's a lot of indifference to the situation, so we need to bring the conversation into the institutions, into institutions such as this one, so that the conversation can keep, go keep on going. I'm part of the Foreign Affairs Ministry and the Foreign European Affairs uh, Group. And in our work, this is something, this is a topic that we've discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these words, Mr. Pierre Laurent, and thank you for this roundtable, which was organized by Médecins du Monde, Action Against Hunger, and SOS Méditerranée. Today's debate, and it's really relevant for it to be held here in the Senate, is the start of a, round, a series of roundtables on humanitarian crises that have been developing over the years, that have been uh, longer and longer. We don't know what terms to use to describe them anymore within the humanitarian space. Action Against Hunger, uh, SOS Mediterranean, these are associations that are present at on land and at sea, and they really wanted to talk about the application of laws and the, the framework of the laws. 
within these spaces. So the application of fundamental humanitarian principles. This is why we have four experts here today with us, as well as two people who are going to tell their own stories and share their experience firsthand. These three organizations have guided the, today's topic, and Mr. Pierre Laurent has already mentioned a few of the different points. In the course of the few last dozens of years, these journeys and this migration has become more and more dangerous. This is due to the lack of legal means of migration. According to the, OI, to the IM, IOM, <laughs> about 30,000 people have died or disappeared in, at sea during their migration journey. Of course, this is probably a gross underestimation. The exact number of people who have disappeared or died at sea is unknown. So we've seen different border patrol agents that have uh, been and other actors that have been in that space and uh, there's not a legal way to to migrate for these people there's different uh, civil society initiatives that have developed within that framework but access to these zones by migrants is difficult, is made difficult by the context. There are enormous needs, and these needs are not met by any but, uh, these These needs are not met, and this in this context, we really wanted to talk about humanitarian spaces which are established spaces, but then the concept of maritime spaces aren't as well established. We're going to cover the, the legal framework around this topic. In 2022, this legal framework dictates what access people can have to these spaces. I've mentioned that there are four speakers today. I will introduce them but I think you know their names. First, I would like to give the floor to two, so the two people who are going to tell their experience, talk about their experience. They're going to say concretely what uh, Rescue at Sea looks like. They, at some point, for better or worse, were at sea. First, I'd like to call Moussa Kamara. Please come take the floor. Moussa Kamara was saved by the Aquarius ship in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. He was 15 at the time. We're going to have five minutes for each speaker, each of these two speakers. Musa, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. As you've heard, my name is Musa Kamara. I'm from Guinea, Guinea Conakry. I was saved by the Aquarius ship that was chartered by SOS Mediterranée. I left Guinea for family reasons. I met various people throughout my journey. This is how I got to Libya. I left Conakry, I went to Mali first, and I stayed there for a few years. Then I went to Burkina Faso, and then Niger. I spent weeks in the desert. I came to Libya. I met a man who was from Bamako. 
He was the reason I left there, because he has a brother in Libya who asked him for help. I went with him, and I was very young. He asked me if I wanted to come with him. That's how I left Mali. We went to Burkina Faso, Niger, and the desert. And then we went to Saba Saba in Libya. Then he called his brother. His brother said someone would come and take us to uh, Tripoli, which is the Libyan capital. He sent a taxi, and the taxi driver took us. We were on our way, and we found that there was a roadblock. There were some people in uniforms. They intercepted us. They put us in another car. They put hoods over our heads. We ended up in a house where we didn't know anyone. We didn't know where we were. One man told us we had been sold and that we needed to work for him. Two days later, he took us to a field. He had some fields for agriculture and we had to work there for six months. And if we didn't work, they would shoot at us. They would point their guns at us. Some people died there because they were shot. Some people fell sick and died because they had no access to care. After harvest, this man chose to free us. He took us in a truck, sent us all the way to a beach. And in the evening, we were told to board a Zodiac. And the man that was traveling with me said that he didn't want to come, he didn't want to go on that boat because he wanted to meet his brother. He just wanted to go meet his brother. He insisted, and everybody was armed, so they shot him. They forced the rest of us onto the Zodiac. They told us, either you get on or we'll shoot you. We were over a hundred people. We weren't able to sit properly. We were very tight, like sardines. It was nighttime. We couldn't see the waves. There were waves, but we couldn't see anything around us. But we heard the screams. We heard babies, children crying. There were pregnant women on board as well. The sun started rising, and we saw the sea and the waves. We didn't see anything around us, anything else. And there was a hole then in the boat. Water was coming inside. We were so tight inside that boat, so packed. Some people died there. Some people were sick, and it was very difficult for them. In that small zodiac, some people died. They just couldn't make it. We tried to help each other. We tried to balance the boat because there was water inside that was coming in. We spent 24 hours at sea. At the end, we were only about 60 left. And all of us had started forgiving one another, had started saying our goodbyes because we had no hope that we were going to be rescued. Several hours later, SOS Mediterranean came. The ship Aquarius came. We saw it and started screaming. There were people drowning more and more but they came and saved us. We climbed onto the boat, onto the ship, the Aquarius, and uh, then they gave us food, clothing. 
They really took care of us. They brought us to Sicily in Italy. Once we got there, we went to some centers for housing. It was during the elections. There were elections, and I had come from Guinea. In Guinea, we speak French. It's our official language. I thought I'd go to France and improve my French instead of learning a new language. I took a train that I couldn't pay every time I was stopped and had to get off. And it took me weeks because every time you have to hide. Finally, I got to Marseille. I didn't know anyone there. Then people told me about an organization where they knew about host families. This is how I was able to go to a host family. I went to different host families, 16 in one month, in fact. And then one host family decided to just host me during my during all of the administrative processes that I had to go through. Then I was integrated into society. Then I spent two years in another housing center, and then I did a training, vocational training, to become an electrician. This year, I'm going to do a second degree, also for to be an electrician. And then I implemented my own association to participate in the integration of foreigners coming to Marseille who don't know where to go. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Musa. Coucou Moussa. Et maintenant, on va écouter le, le témoignage de Justine, qui l'expliquera bien mieux que moi, mais qui est membre de l'équipe de sauveteurs à bord de l'Ocean Viking. Euh, Moussa a été sauvé par l'Aquarius, qui était l'ancien euh, navire de, des SOS Méditerranée, et euh, Justine travaille à bord de l'Ocean Viking. Bonjour, euh, je suis ravie de pouvoir euh, vous partager cet après-midi un petit bout de la complexité des opérations qu'on mène euh, en Méditerranée centrale. Et pour ce faire, je vais me concentrer sur euh, deux phases euh, d'une opération de sauvetage, à savoir la phase de recherche, qui enclenche l'opération, et la phase post-sauvetage jusqu'à la débarque des naufragés, qui, elle, matérialise la fin d'une opération. Donc, concernant la phase de recherche, euh, lorsqu'on est en phase de recherche, donc dans notre zone de patrouille, on active une veille constante euh, aux jumelles. Donc, ça veut dire que depuis la passerelle de l'océan Viking, il y a minimum euh, un marin sauveteur qui constamment euh, scrute l'horizon du lever au coucher du soleil à la recherche d'une possible embarcation en détresse qui, bien souvent, ne ressemble qu'à une petite tache euh, au loin sur l'horizon. Il faut garder en tête en fait, qu'on navigue dans une zone euh, où le centre maritime de référence qui gère la coordination des secours est relativement euh, absent. Et donc, les étapes attendues dans le soutien en matière de recherche et sauvetage ne sont pas appliquées. Donc pour éviter de nous, marins sauveteurs, naviguer à vue, on s'appuie sur des mécanismes palliatifs qui ont été mis en place essentiellement par des acteurs de la société civile. On compte notamment le réseau citoyen Alarm Phone, qui est une hotline qui relaie les, les appels de détresse en mer et donc qui nous, nous permet à l'échelle du bateau d'avoir connaissance d'une embarcation euh, possiblement en détresse. Euh, il y a aussi un, tout un réseau d'ONG patrouilleurs, donc, euh, qui patrouillent euh, sur la mer, qui patrouillent dans les airs. Il y a Sea-Watch, Open Arms, euh, pilotes volontaires, qui eux, en fait, avec leur patrouille, nous, permettent, euh, bah, nous sont d'une aide précieuse puisqu'ils nous permettent d'affiner la géolocalisation d'une embarcation en détresse. Et dans de rares cas, on a aussi l'appel, euh, pardon, le soutien par les patrouilleurs de Frontex, euh, puisque en fait, ils émettent des médées sur les ondes radio, et donc ça nous aiguille, là encore, euh, dans nos recherches d'embarcations en détresse. L'enjeu majeur, en fait, sans surprise, pendant toute cette phase de recherche, qui dure euh, plusieurs jours, 
euh, ben, c'est celle de gagner du temps, de gagner du temps pour sauvegarder en fait, des vies humaines. Euh, il faut se rendre euh, au plus vite sur zone, en sachant que se rendre au plus vite, ça peut aussi impliquer plusieurs heures de navigation. Et il faut aussi se rendre au plus vite sur zone, puisqu'il euh, y a l'évolution des conditions météorologiques en parallèle. Et elles sont souvent euh, préjudiciables pour les occupants des embarcations, puisque les embarcations sont surchargées et par nature euh, impropres euh, à la navigation. Donc, euh, gagner du temps, mais aussi sans assurance d'arriver à temps et euh, ni même de retrouver l'embarcation. Ça, c'est la phase de recherche. Ensuite, on a l'opération en elle-même, selon des modus operandi euh, précis. Et ensuite, on a le, la phase post-opération, à partir du moment où l'ensemble euh, des naufragés deviennent des rescapés sur le pont euh, de l'océan Viking. Donc, la phase post-opération, en fait, dès la fin euh, d'une un, première opération, il y a une demande de lieu sûr où débarquer les rescapés qui est effectuée auprès des autorités, puisque la débarque dans un lieu sûr, comme je vous l'ai dit, matérialise la fin d'une opération de sauvetage. La difficulté, là encore, à laquelle nous nous heurtons, c'est qu'à euh, l'échelle européenne, il n'existe pas de mécanisme d'attribution de lieux sûrs, et donc, par voie de conséquence, il n'existe aucune assurance que les, resca que les rescapés soient débarqués dans les plus brefs délais. Et en fait, pour nous, ces délais euh, sont synonymes d'une grande incertitude. Actuellement, il se passe 10 à 11 jours entre le moment du premier sauvetage et le moment où ces rescapés peuvent euh, débarquer. Euh, ces délais donc, sont aléatoires et malheureusement, ils tendent euh, à s'allonger. Et cette inconnue temporelle, en fait, elle est extrêmement pesante pour la vie à bord. Elle a des répercussions directes sur le bien-être physique et mental des rescapés, qui sont déjà des individus fragilisés par leur parcours migratoire, ensuite fragilisés par plusieurs jours en mer, parfois avant qu'on les trouve, et là encore, qui doivent puiser davantage dans leur, dans leur système de résilience. Euh, il arrive régulièrement que l'équipe médicale à bord demande des évacuations d'urgence, ou bien il est aussi arrivé que, dans la détresse induite par cette attente, euh, des individus, des personnes est sautée par-dessus bord. Cette inconnue temporelle, elle pose aussi des difficultés logistiques, logistiques en termes de rations alimentaires et la suffisance de ces rations, en termes de promiscuité d'espace, puisque c'est souvent plusieurs centaines d'individus qui sont à bord, en termes d'exposition aussi de ces rescapés aux aléas climatiques, euh, actuellement, on est en octobre, on entre dans des conditions euh, hivernales de navigation. Ça veut dire des rescapés qui sont soumis à la pluie, au vent, à une mer agitée, au fait d'être mouillés pendant plusieurs jours, euh, au mal de mer. Tout ça, c'est des conditions qui sont peu soutenables sur plusieurs jours. Et enfin, pour conclure, euh, ce temps d'errance et cet inconnu temporel, donc vous avez compris, elle se répercute à bord euh, du navire, mais elle se répercute aussi plus largement sur la zone méditerranéenne, puisque cette attente nous tient euh, éloignés d'une zone de patrouille où nous patrouillons parce qu'on sait la réalité de l'urgence euh, maritime et on sait davantage en fait, la, la difficulté et l'insuffisance des réponses euh, apportées. Je vous remercie pour votre écoute et je vous souhaite une bonne table ronde. Merci Justine, en plus tu, tu fais une partie de mon travail, tu as passé directement la parole et c'est super. Euh, on va passer effectivement à cette, à cette table ronde. Euh, je me tourne vers les, 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 les 3 plus 1 euh, panélistes, 3 qui sont sur place et une quatrième personne qui est depuis Bruxelles. Euh, je vais vous les citer dans, et, et, et expliquer leurs fonctions dans l'ordre dans lequel... Elles prendront la parole. Euh, il y a d'abord Catherine Benoît. Je crois que les noms sont devant là. Catherine Benoît, qui est professeure d'anthropologie au Connecticut College de, aux États-Unis. José Pablo Baraybar, qui est anthropologue légiste pour le Comité international de la Croix-Rouge, appelé aussi le CICR, euh, à Paris. Alina Miron, qui est professeure de droit public, spécialiste du droit de la mer et de droit international public à l'Université d'Angers. 
Et donc, euh, à distance, Simona Ardovino, qui est membre de la division responsable de la politique de l'Union européenne concernant la migration et les affaires intérieures, que l'on appelle aussi la DG Home, maison, donc. Euh, je vais donner donc la parole d'abord à Catherine, Catherine Benoît, euh, anthropologue franco-américaine, parce que je crois que vous y tenez. Euh, et avec cette euh, démarche euh, qui va paraître peut-être surprenante, mais euh, salutaire, euh, avec l'idée de se décentrer euh, un peu de la, de la Méditerranée, euh, alors qu'on est en on était, euh, et, on, on, et, on, et on va y revenir sur, sur, sur la Méditerranée, mais parce que la question du sauvetage euh, et de l'espace maritime va bien au-delà de la Méditerranée. C'est ce que va nous permettre notamment de, de découvrir euh, Catherine Benoît. Il me revient donc la tâche, c'est bon là, de proposer une description et une analyse globale de la situation des espaces maritimes dans le monde au regard des traversées migratoires mortelles. Et ma communication s'intitule d'ailleurs Les espaces maritimes comme cimetière marin. Je voudrais saluer l'initiative de Médecins du Monde, SOS Méditerranée et Action contre la faim pour le lancement de ce cycle de table ronde sur les espaces maritimes comme espaces humanitaires. Non seulement trop peu d'actions de sauvetage existent dans ces espaces sillonnés de bateaux d'exilés qui font naufrage sans être secourus, mais l'analyse politique et militante de cette situation, condition préalable à de nouvelles initiatives de sauvetage et de soins, est encore à produire. Cette table ronde en est la première étape. Je développerai mon propos autour de trois points. Le tournant océanique des sciences sociales anglo-saxonnes concernant les représentations que nous avons des espaces maritimes, l'émergence d'une frontière maritime globale extraterritoriale dans les années 90 qui précède celle terrestre, les politiques de la mort ou nécropolitiques, concept développé par Achille Mambé, qui permet de rendre compte de ces politiques migratoires fatales. Je commencerai donc par le tournant océanique. L'expression tournant océanique est la traduction de l'anglais « oceanic turn », un moment dans les sciences sociales anglo-saxonnes à partir duquel les espaces maritimes ont cessé d'être fantasmés, perçus, décrits et analysés comme des espaces vierges de toute humanité ou des espaces de conquête pour l'homme blanc européen. Les espaces maritimes sont en réalité des espaces traversés d'expériences humaines douloureuses et mortelles. La traite transatlantique inaugura des premières migrations forcées massives, cela du début du XVIe siècle jusqu'à la fin du XIXe siècle. Ce sont 12 millions et demi d'Africains qui ont été réduits en esclavage, puis déportés vers le continent américain, près de 2 millions d'entre eux trouvant la mort lors de ces traversées. Mort de faim, de maladies, de dépression, de sévices, de suicides, et aussi jetés par le bord quand les bateaux étaient délestés de leur cargaison humaine pour fuir d'autres navires des les milliers d'exilés disparus et morts de ces 30 dernières années ont transformé les espaces maritimes en cimetières marins. Cette expression est parfois contestée pour celle de fausses communes. En effet, aucun rituel n'accompagne les mourants puis les morts. Il n'y a rituel d'accompagner les différents migrants. Aucune identité personnelle n'est rattachée à celle à celles et ceux dont les corps sont identifiés. L'impossibilité de retrouver les disparus transforme les vivants en des morts qui ne peuvent accomplir leur travail de deuil du fait de ces pertes en vie. La perte en vie est mise en psychiatrie, la souffrance liée à la perte d'une personne physiquement absente, les présences sont de l'autre. Huit cimetières marins gisent au fond des océans. La fréquence des naufrages, le nombre de morts et de disparus, les fonctions de l'actualité géopolitique et des politiques migratoires mortelles à des fins, je reviendrai plus tard. La base de données du projet Migrants disparus, hébergé par l'Office international des migrations, ainsi que d'autres inventaires propres à des ONG ou des organismes de recherche, répertorient les naufrages, les morts et disparus, inventoriés par eux d'éventuels secours, les déclarations des familles ou mentionnées dans les médias. Il va sans dire que les chiffres publiés sont largement sous-estimés, je vais les rapporter par ordre D'abord la Méditerranée, du moins tant que la situation du canal du Mozambique continue d'être ignorée. 
Et il faut identifier que 1871 morts ont été répertoriés entre 2014 et 2022. Ensuite, le canal du Mozambique, ce bras de mer entre les Comores, Madagascar et Mayotte. Entre 10 000 morts, selon un rapport du Sénat publié en 2012, il y a donc 000 ans, et 50 000 selon nos estimations qui nous semblent plus. On y reviendra peut-être lors de la discussion. Le troisième cimetière marin est la route des Canaries avec 2879 morts. En Asie, 1500 morts en mer qui sont des ressortissants en Bangladeshi et en Rohingya. Le Pacifique, où les morts sont inventoriés par un groupe de recherche de l'université de Monash en Australie avec 1720 morts comptabilisés entre 2007 et 2019. Il y a ensuite la mer des Caraïbes avec 800 morts. La Caraïbe est le deuxième site où l'on compte le plus de morts en Amérique après la frontière mexicano-étasunienne. Enfin, le golfe d'Aden avec 531 morts et la Manche de L'expression « tournant océanique » réfère également à un changement dans les représentations des espaces insulaires, qui eux aussi ne sont plus l'objet des fantasmes exotisants de la littérature, de la conquête, de l'exploration de soi ou de la propagande touristique. Certains de ces espaces sont d'abord des destinations mortelles, puisqu'il faut traverser océans et mers pour les atteindre, afin de pouvoir déposer une demande d'asile ou de s'installer. Ils sont aussi des espaces d'invisibilisation, de la rétention administrative, ou de traitement des demandes d'asile en fait de leur éloignement des continents, comme dans le cas des îles Cocos en 2002 et de l'île Prismos en où l'Australie transfère sur ses propres territoires les demandeurs d'asile arrivés par bateau sur ses côtes. Ces îles sont surtout des espaces d'exception dans le sens défini par Agamben. Les dérogations à la loi deviennent fixées dans la loi. Et il est plus facile pour les administrations de violer les lois en l'absence de l'ordre d'observatrice. In these very territories, and there are also many controls in terms of asylum in the different hotspots for the Mediterranean Sea. There is also the Guantanamo base in the United States. My second point is the global maritime border. It's uh, at the end of the 1990s that this concept was established. It is characteri characterized by four elements. First of all, uh, it has to be far from the cost for the American and Australian cases. So it is very difficult to know what is taking place in these spaces, even if we are aware of them. In 2001, Australia um, established the Pacific solution, that is to say, it transferred the management of asylum seekers into uh, remote islands. For example, in uh, Amanus, in Papua New Guinea. So the detention centers are closed, but the um, migrant camps are still open. And uh, just for the story, France wanted to do more or less the same thing. The second part is about all the riders and all the police control to prevent the arrival of uh, migrants and people that are exiling. Uh, in the US, uh, the, li the coast guards are operating from different islands. In the, uh, for example, in Haiti, the asylum seekers are sent to uh, Guantanamo, then the French specialty. In the overseas islands, it's more easy to control the identity of people. It is not needed to have the authorization of the prosecutor to carry out identity checks. And finally, the externalization of asylum seekers for people coming from sea for the US, for Europe, or for Australia. So the implementation of this global maritime border goes back to the 1990s. Even if the first steps started in the 1980s for the overseas department. Under the presidency of Bill Clinton, there was a step to prevent the arrival of Cuban migrants to the US. And there, was, there were also patrols established in the Caribbean. In France, there is the request of a visa since 1995 for Comoros people that want to go to Mayotte. 
So the um, Comorian families are using very light boats and they are reaching Mayotte in an illegal way instead of using uh, normal commercial boats. Uh, these are called Kuasa Kuasa. You've heard of it probably. So the crossing, uh, thanks to these boats, have become deadly because there are six meter long boats and they are being done in very difficult conditions to escape the coast guards and the brutal interceptions. In 1998, France reinforced its own maritime border in the Caribbean. So there were specific regimes for Martinique, Guadeloupe, for instance. And this French maritime border is also that of the European Union, because actually the Schengen agreements do not apply there. In Cayman, in the Cayman Islands, in Jamaica, these are also taking place. My third point, necropolitics. For um, Achil Membe, a Cameroonese philosopher, the sovereignty is the right to uh, kill, so to decide who can live and who has to die. The contemporary forms of the power are showing the power of death. The um, necropolitics regime are following the um, colonial regimes, and this is uh, how terror takes place. According to Mr. Membe, the colonial occupation is a question of delimitation and uh, how to take control on a different area. This was how to deal with uh, space relationships, new territories. This is creating lines of hierarchies of different boundaries. This is uh, how there are many uh, people that uh, die. As a conclusion, as we are living in a world Kant has described about the necessity to create, to, to be hosting people, we are wondering how we can have, how we can welcome the the people coming from former colonies that are becoming more and more present. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Uh, Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, taking this distance from the Mediterranean Sea and putting things into perspective according to history and geography. I think your presentation was very strong, and I also noted the concept of absence of identification for many people concerned, whichever the maritime cemetery is. And this will be a good transition to the talk by Jose Pablo Baraibar, this question of identification. As you are a forensic anthropologist at the ICRC, you are in charge of the Counting the Dead program that aims at giving the dignity back to bodies and people. So this is the continua continuation of this quest to do, put the right words on a reality. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. Catherine has talked about so many things that I don't want to repeat. I will adapt. I will adapt my speech after what she has said. So I am going to talk about the people that wanted to find a new life and that never reach Europe. So these are the people that are not named. These are the people that are often nicknamed or named as missing people. And I would also like to talk about what some people um, about how people talk about the, the wall 
between the um, North Africa and Europe. So once again, I think it's very important to say that not knowing if your daughter is going to uh, the, the nightclub on a Friday night, then you go to the police and the, the police doesn't know what to do. It's exactly this very feeling not to know. And when it lasts months, years, it's very difficult because we don't know who can give you an answer. Jose Pablo, please could you talk closer to the microphone? So the first thought is why are we using such ambiguous terms? For instance, if a person is using a boat that is a rubber boat, for instance, to cross the Atlantic and if or the Mediterranean Sea and these people, um, he is not taken aboard boats by NGOs. Uh, what is it? These people are disappearing. Well, we prefer to talk about missing people. And to make things more complex, we can even talk about dead missing people. You can see statistics about dead missing people. What does it mean? Not much, actually, because behind each figure, there is a person, a person whose family is uh, looking for them and who doesn't know. So I will give you some very simple stat statistics. We've talked about statistics, but the thing is, the, the thing is that in the end, each group is counting. There is nothing wrong about statistics. But all the figures we have are underestimations, all of them. So I will give you some examples about 2020, 2021. We will use only two years to illustrate this situation. In the central Mediterranean space, there were 2,573 people that died or were missing. But how many bodies of these people have been retrieved? Only 2%. Then in the Western Mediterranean area, 10% of the bodies were retrieved. In the Canary Island, 2.5%. So where are these people? Somewhere else in on the planet? How many bodies have been retrieved in Maghreb or on the Atlantic coast up to Senegal? We don't know. But what we know is that a very high proportion of these people are dead and that their family are looking for answers. So we have to choose our estimations. We could think that by combining our data with the Canary route and the central Mediterranean route, we could talk about 9,000 dead missing people. I'm using the common terminology here. The question is, what do we do or what can we do to give a name to these people and to give an answer to these families, not to all the families. We cannot contact all the families, but there are many cases for which we could do it. At the ICRC, we have created a pilot project in the Canary Island in order to reconstitute these uh, events, the boats that were arriving with the number of people on the boat, by uh, contacting people that were in the Zodiac boats. So how can we do that? Maybe we can talk with the people who arrived to know more about the people who didn't. And this will allow us to elaborate something to answer the questions of the family. But if we do that with the family, it's already a lot. The 
issue is how can we build answers for the family? What do we need for that? And we need many things for that. We need a lot of information for that. So who's living? For instance, that kind of information exists. You can look on Facebook, for instance, to find that kind of information. We have information about the people that are carrying out the um, rescuing work in the Mediterranean Sea. Where did they find the Zodiac? How many people were on board? Were there uh, children, women? Uh, what were their nationalities? This allows us to get some information. If we can use this information and connect them to the different individuals and situations, then we wouldn't be here. Well, we developed many tools that allow us to analyze and use this data. It's a bit like big data, but it's not something fantastic. Anyway, it allowed us, thanks to the Canary project, to give about 100 answers. You can say that uh, it's almost nothing, but it's much better than nothing. The last thing I would like to mention is this wall, this hidden submarine wall that separates Africa from Europe. This wall exists. What is it made of? It's made of bodies, bodies of people that could not be named, but that have a name and that are expecting to get their name and dignity back, like their family. So it's a humanity work that comes back to us, and we want to focus on this. Merci beaucoup, José. Thank you very much, José Pablo. There is everybody here in the room and uh, 160 people following us online so everybody can participate. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the third person who's with us uh, physically, Elena Miron, who is a public law lecturer, specialist of the law of the sea, and she's the director of the legal clinic named The Lighthouse. Now we're going to talk about access to populations in distress. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having invited me. Thanks, SOS Mediterranée. I didn't choose any title for what I was going to speak about. I just wanted to talk about what already exists. Unfortunately, we forget that these tools exist. And we wanted to talk about the access to populations in distress at sea and the protection of the people who rescue them. This access has an uncertainty factor, and it's related to the law. I'm going to get back to it at the end. So it's uh, all of the different failures within the law. But I just wanted to remind us of what exists in terms of uh, rescue at sea. There are legal duties that have been established. There were duties that had been established for hundreds of years, including the one to rescue people in distress at sea. If you ask sailors, they really feel that within themselves. They cannot let people die at sea if they know that they are in distress. It's a customary obligation that you then find within the legal framework and that the sailors really feel. I really want to insist on that. It's people who are at sea who really feel that most, most of all. They're at the front lines, and sometimes they cannot help these people, even though they feel duty-bound to do so. So it is mandatory for EU member states to uh, rescue people at sea. According to Article 98 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, this 
article says clearly that anyone who is in distress at sea should be rescued and brought to a place of safety as quickly as possible. There is little room for doubt if you read the texts. There are more technical texts that were adopted within the framework of international maritime law because this is really a matter that is first and foremost related to sailors. So in 79, there's the Hamburg Convention, which is an SAR convention, which lays out the technical rules for rescue. I think SOS Mediterranean is very familiar with them. At this 79 convention, the member states have added amendments in order to meet the needs of mass rescue. In 79, there were technical rules that were established for uh, incidents at sea, but what we've seen for now a few years in the Mediterranean are people in distress, but within the framework of mass migration through the maritime spaces. So the states that were party to the 79 Convention had adopted have adopted rules in terms of disembarkation specifically for mass rescue operations. There needed to be rules established and a place of safety so that the ship captain is able to disembark the people on board. The parties to the Montegove Convention have this obligation, but the rules within the EU framework are, have in reality been transferred to the 2014 rule on uh, surveillance on the external borders. So there's this dichotomy between border surveillance and rescue at sea. There's not specific uh, rules on rescue operations within this particular EU framework. Who are the protagonists of the of rescue at sea operations? You have, first of all, the flag. So the flag state is the state that needs to make it mandatory for the captain to save people in distress at sea. Then you have states, we have different countries that have access to the sea, they need to have a search and rescue center, so the RCCs. And then you have the different countries that are responsible for coordinating rescue operations in certain areas in order to promote better coordination. And these search and rescue areas are maritime spaces within which a specific country is responsible is the first one that is responsible for coordinating rescue operations. But within the interpretation of these areas, some people think that these are policing areas. These are areas for police patrols. This is the case for Libya. And again, there is no doubt that a search and rescue area is not a sovereign, is not under the responsibility, legal responsibility of this um, these countries. These are just zones for search and rescue operations. So we've seen some violations of um, competencies of, of jurisdiction within these, uh, these areas. And based on the 2004 amendments, there's also the obligation to find a place of safety that's the main so th this country is the main country responsible for finding a place of safety, but not the only responsible. But picture the Mediterranean. If all of the countries refuse to cooperate with the country that is responsible for search and rescue, then you run into difficulties. That's why this text has remained this beautiful text that is not applied, because the other countries around the area are washing their hands of this responsibility. 
they're not stepping up and saying that people can be disembarked in their countries. Generally speaking, the people that are responsible for the, the, the countries responsible for the SAR zones are the ones that are mainly responsible, but not the only ones. The countries really are failing. It's a moral uh, shortcoming and a legal one as well, because a country shouldn't be just on the front lines and bear the entire responsibility. They shouldn't have to find the, this place of safety alone. Also, we think that the place of safety, we wrongfully think that the place of safety has to be the closest port, and it's not necessarily the case. It can be another port. It's not necessarily the closest one. So Italy shouldn't be the main place where people are disembarked all the time, nor Greece. And in terms of the other shortcomings that we see, there's an entire policy of harassment towards humanitarian players. This harassment was already seen through several processes which criminalize rescue operations. This means that the captains who had undertaken search and rescue operations were accused, were accused of migrant smuggling. This criminalization of these actors usually uh, would lead to uh, the well lead to the fact that the NGOs were found not guilty. These actors were found not guilty, and in the EU, there is a law or rather a convention, the Convention of Palermo and the Convention on uh, Smuggling of Migrants. And this convention says that the member states may plan or not some measures for NGOs. Some have done so. Some have said that the NGOs cannot be accused of saving lives, but in 2017, there was no reason to suspect that this protocol, the Palermo Protocol, would be misinterpreted. Now I'm not so sure. But in the EU directives, there wasn't a reason to explicitly make an exception for uh, humanitarian aid. The second form of harassment that we see are the abusive inspections by port authorities. This doesn't directly criminalize ships or NGOs, but it does prevent ships from going out and saving more lives because of the lengthy administrative processes, which doesn't make the rescue operations any easier. So what can we do to answer this problem? First, I think we should be following the existing legal framework, which already gives us some answers. But the existing legal framework is not sufficient in certain cases. And in Justine's uh, testimony, I've heard a the confirmation of that, the absence within the EU of a coordination mechanism that it would be EU-wide. The idea of the EU reform is that we are not Right now, we cannot talk about disembarkation without reforming the asylum laws. The two are linked. The asylum laws and the Dublin regulations w about how long the asylum seeking process should take are linked. De facto, the member state that is going to accept the disembarkation of these people will also be responsible for the administrative processes of these people. But this doesn't need to be the case. We could have a coordination 
of disembarkation of these people in a safe place that is not Libya, that is the EU, and that is not linked to the to Dublin, I think we should also reflect on a public service of rescue operations. We've seen humanitarian uh, players that are there to face the, the, these shortcomings, to make up for these shortcomings in the EU. There is a search and rescue system for people who are at sea for leisure, but there is no such system for migrants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. We're going to finish this part of the uh, panel with uh, Simon uh, let's see, with Simona Ardovino, who is our last speaker for the day. She is representing the EU. She is. I. I think you have uh, noted that I will leave her the floor. Maybe we can have a sort of answer to the questions from the previous speaker, Elena, and maybe we'll better understand the uh, framework and the and how the European Commission plays a role. And I think that's the end of my question. Simona, please take the floor. Thank you. Hen Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. I communicated with the organizers. I heard some of the time. I think I've heard most of the interventions, but not everything. But please let me know if there's anything else that I can bring to the table and any questions I can answer. First of all, thank you for having invited the uh, European Commission to this round table. This really gives us the means to reflect on a topic that is unfortunately still very relevant to this day. And thank you, uh, Mr. Moussa Kamara, for your testimony. I'm going to focus on the approach of the European Commission in terms of search and rescue operations, especially faced with the, the pact that was adopted in 2020. This is something that was unprecedented on the topic and which makes explicit the need to have a, an overall approach. The EU is convinced that migration is an ongoing phenomenon that has always happened throughout our history and that we should be able to manage. But it is clear that the uh, EU and the different players in the EU cannot accept that some people are pushed onto makeshift boats and uh, are put in danger at the risk of losing their lives. So saving lives at sea is a legal obligation, as was already mentioned. The Commission, the EU Commission has recognized that many times, and it's also in our documents. We cannot overlook this loss of life at sea. This is why we need to act and be and get coordinated. Of course, search and rescue at sea are a national responsibility. The EU Commission cannot itself launch a search and rescue operation or coordinate a search and rescue operation. But we do have a moral and political responsibility in terms of preventing the loss of life at sea. So it is essential to work together on this matter, politically and at sea. 
within the framework of this pact on migration and asylum adopted in 2020. For the first time, explicitly, we have uh, documented or we have adopted this approach, which has several pillars that I wanted to evoke first. We deem that cooperation and coordination between member states and between all the different players involved in search and rescue operations are essential. This coordination and cooperation must be strengthened. The member states must fulfill their obligations in terms of international law and keep on developing search and rescue as, the do as our documents say. They must also implement measures urgently to bring aid to any person in distress at sea. And the disembarkation to a place of safety needs to happen quickly, as the professor said earlier. This is necessary because rescue and search and rescue operations have developed in the last few years. There's some private actors that are involved. And this is a new phenomenon that has appeared in the last few years. This requires specific strength and coordination because many people are uh, saved and merchant ships also have an important role. This also has its own challenges, different types of them. Sailors take on board people that are drowning at sea because it's not just a legal obligation, it's a moral one as well. You must bring assistance to people in distress at sea. So there's different roles which create complicated legal situations. Our task is to clarify this situation and adapt it to the reality of what is happening at sea, which is evolving rapidly. With the recommendations that we have made to national authorities that have jurisdiction, we have wanted to ask them to have better coordination and have a specific contact group put in place to move forward. This is one pillar of our approach. The second pillar is that there are specific applications to manage the flow of migration, especially for coastal states. We have proposed a new regulation within the new European Pact for Migration and Asylum regarding search and rescue based on the guarantee between of a balance between the responsibility for solidarity on one hand because, and recognizing that no member state should have to disproportionately bear that burden and we, sh we need to ensure constant solidarity. This is why we need to have a specific mechanism for the relocalization of the people that have been disembarked following search and rescue operations. The pact is still being negotiated, and the legislators are trying to move forward quickly. Thirdly, there is the aspect of the, of the smugglers, and we would like to prevent the this uh, Ill illegal entry to the EU. In the EU, we cannot also we cannot criminalize NGO activities. This is explicit. This is also part of this pact. Of it's in the guidance, especially when humanitarian aid is required by law, especially when you're talking about search and rescue uh, operations led by private actors. 
it doesn't mean that we want to uh, well it, it means that we want to uh, avoid dangerous situations and avoid criminalizing the NGOs that are doing search and rescue operations within the framework of the action plan of an action plan that was renewed it's the second one in 2021, the Commission has announced two things, among others. First, an intensification of the follow-up on the implementation of laws against smuggling in order to impose sanctions. But we also want to watch out for the criminalization of people who just bring humanitarian aid to migrants. There will be there will be sanctions against people who are smuggling migrants, however. And the EU will review this uh, this body of text. The last pillar I wanted to talk about is that of prevention. When you talk about people you know, when people are already at sea, it's very late. It's much too late. We need to see what are the sources, what are the reasons for migration. And we need to work to prevent dangerous crossings. This is a priority on the long term, but in this sense, I also wanted to underline the continued effort by the EU Commission and by various member states to offer the most vulnerable people access to protection and shelter in the EU. This is really a crucial part of our policy. In terms of resettlement, we have had policies in place since 2015. I think over 100,000 refugees were able to find shelter in the EU through this program. In conclusion, I think it is our common duty, the duty of the Commission, of civil society players, of the EU member states, to have a more coordinated framework for search and rescue operations, which takes into account the complexity of the migration phenomenon. We think our efforts in terms of search and rescue shouldn't be an isolated uh, point. They should be part of an overall approach. And the Commission is trying hard to coordinate a voluntary solidarity mechanism. This is an important point when you talk about uh, the uh, EU policies, it threw, and this has been underlined after the uh, after France became the president of the EU. This is only a first step in the progressive imp implementation of the pact, but it already brings an answer in terms of solidarity, and solidarity remained at the at the heart of our approach in terms of migration and in terms of search and rescue operations. I think I'll stop here because I think it'll be interesting to go on to questions and answers. Thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you very much, Ms. Ardovino. I see Alina and Catherine taking notes on my right or on my left. Maybe you have some questions for Simona Ardovino or maybe for Jose Pablo. Maybe Jose Pablo doesn't have a pen, so he wasn't taking notes. Maybe that's why. We're going to go on to a questions and answers portion. Maybe some of you have prepared questions here in the room and online as well. We're a little bit late, but we will do our best to 
to relay your questions. So Simona Ardovino was our last speaker. Do you have any comments? Yes. I was pleased to see the uh, this matter of criminalization of NGOs that is being discussed in Brussels. The EU has adopted. Well, I don't think people were hearing me. I was saying something good. Oh, the uh, connection. The connection was problematic. But in terms of the criminalization of NGOs, even though the Commission hasn't changed the existing framework, the adoption, the adoption of the guidelines is uh, interesting, as well as the fact that people could be brought to justice if they try to get in the way of these rescue operations. Catherine, anything that you'd like to add? Maybe there will be questions in the room. I just wanted to first finish up the round with the panelists. I had taken some notes, and I had a question for Jose Pablo Baraybar about the different victims. I would like him to mention some of the tools that his program uses. What kinds of tools are you have you put in place? I I know that there are some, and I think it'd be interesting for you to elaborate a bit more. A first comment about the EU Commission. We presented the report you have mentioned earlier, Counting the Dead. We shared it with them. This report is not only focusing on the number of dead people that were found by Italy, Spain, and Greece, but also about the specificities of the systems in the different countries to deal with these dead bodies, to identify them, for instance, and clearly, at the European level, there is no framework to deal with that kind of cases. There is the PRIM agreement. We have databases. We have uh, DNA bases that we can use for non-criminal cases, for instance. The issue is that there are no means to compare, because when we talk about identification, it's to compare things that they don't have. For example, how can a family that is in Eritrea can know that the dead body of one of their family members is in a European country? How can we send the DNA? to this country. This mechanism does not exist. What is working, however, is a um, policy cooperation mechanism. This is something real, concrete, and that can be used for humanitarian reasons. Then in uh, every different country, people can do things differently. When it comes to the different tools, I would like to talk about one specific thing with a university uh, called INSA. We developed some very specific tools to make links between people uh, through networks by exploiting data from the social media, from testimonies such as that of Musa, for instance. But there is a next thing that we try to encourage, and this is the big dream. I think we talked about that with Louise in the past. There is the need to have a space or a collaborative platform 
we don't have a better name for that, for which each player can contribute with their data so that they can be analyzed as a whole. Because in reality, until now, what has been preventing us from being able to give answers to the families is that all the state and non-state players have only a share of the information. So what we need is to connect all these pieces together, put them all in a big box, if you, if you will. So we need a specific tool to, to, find, to, to connect them and to find the truth. So these tools will be developed at the end of next year. There will be a prototype of this tool to know uh, which player can take care of this and manage all this data. Because as you know, data is information and information is power. So uh, how can we use this data? Will it be used for good things or not? Sometimes the, the states and the families do not have the information they need. So there are lots of questions. We could talk about that for the whole afternoon. But what I wanted to say is that we've done things. Thank you very much. I have a question for Catherine. It's a double question, actually. And maybe it's linked to the question about the EU. I think many of us don't know well what you talked about, migrations from the Mozambique channel. I would like you to come back to this route and the condition of migrations on this route. And I have another question. Because I am not an expert in that topic. You talked about Comorian people and Mayotte. Mayotte is part of the French territory. Does is the EU also concerned? So does the borders of the EU go up to Mayotte and the Comoros? Maybe my question is stupid. Well I've heard that actually there were no stupid questions. Yes. So when it comes to the question of the EU, yes, Mayotte is part of the EU. It's an overseas territory since 2011. And thanks to that, it's part of the EU. Boris, I, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. I just wanted to say that I cannot hear anything. So if you send me some questions. I won't be able to answer them probably because the sound is very low. I could hear the last question, but the last answer, but I cannot hear your question. So I think you have to shout the questions to me. So can you hear me, for instance? Mm, I'm not sure. This was not a question for the EU anyway. So yes, Mayotte is part of Europe. And the Schengen Convention does not apply to overseas territories, overseas territory. So if foreigners, citizens go to uh, this overseas territory to go to France afterwards, it's um, it's a mistake because they cannot take the plane then from these overseas territories to France, continental France, I would say. The situation of migration in the Mozambique Channel is something that is not very well known. And uh, France is responsible for that. There is no Frontex there. And this is related to the colonial history and to the modalities of the independence of the Comoros Islands. Initially, they were constituted of three islands, three of them, four islands, three of them became independent in the 1970s. And Mayotte in the 1970s, against international law, decided to remain French. So France would, should have respected the, the principle of the intangibility of the borders. 
So the United Nations blamed France for that for 20 years, but we won't enter into the legal context. Anyway, when they decided to prepare the new status of Mayotte, France created a visa that is called the Balader visa or the death visa. So it requires the Comorian people to have a visa to go to a territory that has had always been part of the Comoros Islands. So this is a migration for the short or long term. But this is very strange because we created a Eurozone in an area that is very poor. And this region is a space of movement and has been so for years. So we could go from Maya to Anjouan uh, on Friday, for instance, to go because when, when they, their situation is regularized, then they don't want to to go back to their original islands. So this space of movement, Mayotte, is a space in which people are staying. There, the number of people in Mayotte that are pushed back to the borders is 30,000 people per year. It's about the same as for France as a whole. So the Comorian people do not take the commercial boats. They take very, um, very fragile boats. So it would be possible to carry out a census in the Comorian Islands, Comoros Island. There are about 830,000 people in the Comoros. But then this is a politic of people that left the islands and questions and numbers about or questions about the numbers of people that came back. So every day there are boats leaving and the sinkings are never informed or documented. I could count eight sinkings uh, in a month with 200 people that died, even if I uh, did not look for that information very specifically. So we don't know anything about the conditions for the crossings. We don't know anything about the, the impact in terms of psychology, economics of uh, this population. There are no psychologists in Anjouan, for example, and very few in Mayotte or none. Actually, there's a whole industry that uh, is related to uh, these dead people because they are very for instance. And when we talk about the Mediterranean Sea, we can know who died. Some bodies are related to the French colonial history. So some of the asylum seekers are losing their life between Madagascar and Mayotte. So these are a few elements to answer this question. And obviously, it would deserve more time to be treated fully. Thank you very much. I am checking if Simona Ardovino can hear me. Are there any questions in the room? You have your own microphones, so you can use them. Are they working? Yes. Can you introduce yourself and uh, say to who you are asking the question? I'm Aspel Albert Spira, Alfred Spira, sorry. I'm a doctor in uh, Briançon in the southeast of France, in the mountain, in the Alps. Thank you very much for this. What is striking me is the similarity of what is taking place uh, on the land border that I know well in Briançon and what is taking place at sea. This is very similar, and we can see the same players, 
the exact people, the people of the humanitarian sector, and also the police. Mr. Barrebar already talked about that. What we established in Briançon with the ANAFE, I'm sorry, uh, it's difficult for me to deal with all the acronyms. Anyway, there is an observation of all the violations of the law by the police. So there is a um, transcript of that. We have a person that is doing a PhD on that. So there is some funding to carry out a census of this. And with Médecins du Monde, we have a full inventory of the medical aspects. So far, we are at the first say stage, so we are compiling data. And we have started the work of analysis about the different modalities of uh, legal violations, about the modalities of application and non-application of the different legal aspects. So uh, this is about um, law of solidarity, um, distances 10, 20 kilometers, non-admission of the territory, or administrative retention on the territory. So this is the first thing I wanted to say. And I'm talking to the organizers and Médecins du Monde. I think it is important to be cautious to have data that can be compatible uh, for what happens at sea and on land at the borders. I am certain that if we could compare this, this would be very rich. The second aspect is that what we are seeking, seeing at the land borders is violations of the law, and they lead to a harassment of the exiled people or a pushback to Italy. I thought I had understood that at sea or around the islands, it was called pushback. That has not been mentioned much. I would like to know more about this. And on the other hand, there is also harassment towards the humanitarian sector. And of the marauder, towards the marauders as well. So it's not at sea, but it's uh, in the snow, in the mountains. So people observing the situation and helping the migrants. So this is carried out by the local police authorities or by people working for the police authorities. I don't want to enter into detail because it's a bit delicate. But at sea, I thought it was Frontex that was the body that should be analyzed. But Frontex has been mentioned only once in all the talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wanted to go back to the data. I think what you said was very important. How can you explain that the journey together, all the players, organizations, for instance, to agree on what every sector has and how we can adopt a single way to deal with this. This is a huge task. I'm not say, saying that it is impossible, but this is very difficult. And I would like to call all the players to know what obstacles they are facing. Maybe we should just share the information with each other. It is not already the time to say who will keep what and who will bear the responsibility to store that. This would be a discussion for later because the different organization players have a big share of the information, but not 
all the information. So that is why we will work with different organizations. And the second part of my question, which is about the lack of answer to the families of missing people, everything is related to what is forbidden. We are not acting according to a humanitarian logic. This is a prohibition. So when we're talking about the humanitarian sector, it's very empty. In terms of operations, what do we talk about? For instance, I will give an example that is included in the report we sent to the EU. Each country manages their, the dead bodies and two or 10% of these bodies are documented, but everything is done so that we cannot reach a conclusion. It's not because they're doing it on purpose. It's just because the system is built to deal with a domestic mortality, not to deal with transnational uh, mass death. Marine is telling me that it's probably working better now. Can you hear me with that, this microphone? I think it's not changing much. Are there some more questions? I have seen two questions in the room, so I'm taking uh, the two over there. Thank you. I'm Claire Rodier. I'm a member of the GST and of the MIG Europe network. I wanted to ask a question to Mrs. Uh, Miron about the status of the SAR zones. They are being determined by self-declaration of the states towards the, um, the International Maritime Organization. They have different uh, they are related to different technical organizations, but since it's uh, based on a self-declaration and based on an agreement, intergovernmental agreement, the determination of the SAR zones is particularly relevant when it comes to operations and realities in terms of rescuing. I am wondering what means of action we can have when a state is not intervening in the SAR region or if an MRCC is not doing his work properly. For instance, when Libya has self-declared its uh, SAR zone at the IMO, this has been done with the collaboration of Malta and Italy. It's much easier for them to have a zone in which they don't have to intervene, and the EU is also aware of that. But we have no means of actions because it's not legal. No one is preventing countries to carry out risky operations in another SAR zone. But Italy and Malta are using this Libyan zone to not to have to act actually on their rescue operations. Thank you very much for your question. We will try to take a few other questions, but not many because we have to leave the room at six. Sarah Prestani from Euro Droit. It's also about the SAR zone. I think we have to know that since the creation of the SAR zone that was created with the agreement of Italy in 2017, 80 southern people have been intercepted at sea by the Libyan authorities and sent back to Libya, uh, sent to detention centers that are directed by militia. But is there not a contradiction between the safe places and the detention centers? 
So according to the SAR zone, there is a total absence of operations at sea by Malta. We have talked about offenses procedures as it been planned to remind Malta that uh, it should take into account and carry out some SAR operations. And more recently, uh, the lack of this uh, SAR, SAR operations um, have not been carried out, and it led to the death of, for instance, a young girl very recently that traveled from Lebanon. This is a question that is related to the legal aspect, so it is for Alina. And then the third question, please be brief. I have lots of questions, but I will try to sum up the situation. I'm Cécile Dumas. I'm a member of the Communist Party in charge of uh, migration questions. My first question is, what means do we have to open a port to um, a vessel that is in the Mediterranean Sea. Which legal means do we have? I've heard the legal frameworks for this SAR zone and the obligation to find a safe port, but in reality, it seems more complicated. The second part, I want to direct my question to the European Commission. Europe has a list of safe countries for the returns to to the countries. I think it's a scandal. For instance, when I know that Afghanistan two days before the arrival, or maybe two weeks before um, the Taliban took over power was on this list, I'm wondering about the legal reality of uh, this list. And two more things about the lack of the, the shortages in terms of legal rights. I met Musa in uh, Vantimi, so maybe, well, I was working there, so maybe I saw you there, I don't know. I was, um, I was working there, I was providing some maps, for instance. So there are some abuses by the police at the borders that do not provide information in the right language to people seeking to enter a new territory. So what legal means do we have against this? And the last aspect, I think it is a scandal that the migration questions are only um, managed by the Minister of Interior in France. It is an issue and it's a scandal because the migration policies and migration stakes and the mobility of uh, the population is something that is important to build a society. Once again, the question uh, is legal. So, Alina Miron, I think it is for you. And for all the speakers, the four speakers, if Simona can hear us, there is also a question about the political dimension you were mentioning. I will try to answer quickly. Maybe we can talk about this in the Luxembourg Garden. About the Libyan SAR zone, there are two realities. The first one is, is the declaration compatible with the SAR rules on the background aspects? It is not compatible because the MRCC never answered the calls, the people cannot speak English, they don't have the legal means for coordination. So it is not compatible. Then there is the question of the notification procedure, but we have to separate both because the procedure goes through a declaration at the IMO and this is this has more to do with the dialogue. The European states did not say anything the second year because Libya, with the European support, filed its notification and the, Euro the European states did not say anything because it's easier for them not to have to deal with that. But it is not too late to react. You can always contest, if not the declaration, its implementation. And I think this is a duty. And then how can we 
implement this obligation? How can we use pressure to have a real dialogue at the IMO? First of all, I think we can use political means for that, and we can also contact the, the Secretary General of the IMO, because in reality, there's a lot of contradictions between a declaration, its goals, and the way it is being implemented. And for Libya, it has been a total failure. It would seem that the EU doesn't have competencies to start a procedure for shortcomings. But uh, Malta, in the fact, is never answering to the calls. And it has been so for years. So this is not an incident. This is a deliberate policy. Can it be done as a procedure uh, at the European institutions? Maybe we won't talk only about the SAR aspects, the only thing is that it could end up with a um, declaration of incompetence by the Court of Justice. I would have liked Simona to tell us about the concrete consequences of the Pact of 2020 about this absence of opening the arbors, the ports. Very often it is based on the obligation of cooperation, and I cannot remember the other questions. But I will stop here because you told me that we are running out of time. I think Simona can hear us now, so maybe she's heard your point. But can you say it again? Can you hear me? Uh, it doesn't seem very reliable. Can you hear me in the chat? I saw that there were questions for me. I think there was one about the pact. I think someone mentioned the sister country national list. At the moment, it is part of the regulation on asylum seekers, but there is also the list that has been voted by the council. I'm not sure about how it is related to the SAR. And this is being negotiated, and there is also the list published by the Council. I heard something about how the political parties could face with issues with disembarkments. I think the Communist Party was mentioned. There is a, a problem with the sound, so I'm very sorry. And the sound is very low. So one of the organizers passed this question on to me, but I'm very sorry. We are sorry for you, too, because you cannot hear much. Francois Simillon would like to say something. I will be very quick. Francois Simillon, I'm a doctor. I'm a vice president of Médecins du Monde, and I'm also president of the CESE. I have a question for Mrs. Simona Ardovino. The Pact on Asylum and Migration has an ambition, but I would like to know about its evolution. You are talking about a general approach. It has been mentioned that land and sea have uh, related issues, but which ambitions do you have? When we listen to the speech by Ursula von der Leyen, there was an ambition about that. She talked about the Ukrainian situation, for instance, but how should this pact evolve? I don't know if she could hear the question or if, she, if the question can be sent to her. I imagine that there are some questions, but I'm very sorry. If Marine can write it in the chat, maybe I can answer it. Uh, 
I think there's an issue because my connection is quite good. Or I can come back later, if, if you will. Par écrit. We can maybe do this in writing. There was a question here in the room. Yes, hello. I had another question about jurisdiction. Ah, OK. I hadn't understand that, understood that. Sorry, could you reformulate the question so that you can ask it? Can she hear us? No? OK. The question is about the evolution of the Asylum and Migration Pact that was voted on a bit earlier, especially regarding maritime spaces. During her speech, uh, the president, Van der Leyen, said that there would be an evolution on land in terms of the uh, temporary protection granted to Ukrainian refugees. Thank you. I think we should be able to answer this. Yes, thank you. My question was about the jurisdiction in terms of the European players. I'm talking about Frontex, for example, because in her presentation, Ms. Simona mentioned that the EU states didn't have this responsibility for search and rescue, but there is a player that is an EU player, Frontex. It's an agency that's present there, and it has drones in this, these maritime spaces. These drones will detect boats in distress. And we know from research works that these drones unofficially communicate information about these uh, boats in distress to the Libyan Coast Guard and are therefore participating in the interception, forced interception of these boats by the Libyan Coast Guard, especially in the SAR zones that, are, that belong to Malta especially. And these people are being sent back to Libya, which is not a safe place for them. So how can we hold these uh, different players accountable, these EU players? And the former director of the uh, of Frontex had been heard at the, at the Senate. And during that intervention, he was being congratulated for his role in Frontex, and there wasn't specific mention about the suspected human rights violations at the EU border. This subject, I think, should be touched on. OK, just a quick summary. Does Frontex collaborate with authorities of certain countries, and can they be held accountable? Sure, I think we can ask uh, Simona Ardovino this question. We are going to need to conclude because everyone will have to have left the Senate by 6.30, and it's going to take a while. I bear this heavy burden of concluding, bringing to a close this first roundtable. And the first is always important. This is a cycle of roundtables that have been launched. So stay tuned to see what will happen next. There is a real need for these reflections. We need to take the time 
And I think it does justify having more roundtables. Thank you all for ha your presence, whether online or in person. Thank you so much to the speakers. Thank you very much to the, the two people have, that have brought their testimonies. Thank you. Does SOS Mediterranean have a question? Just an information for those who would like, uh, who are in person, who want to keep on going. We have reserved a space, six place in Montrostan, outside the Senate. On your right, you're going to go along the Luxembourg Park, and you'll see Café Rostan with a D. Thank you all. Have a good evening.